Diverticular disease has a very characteristic presentation because it's causing you to have pain in your left lower quadrant. Now you might say, well dude, how do you know that that's not an ectopic pregnancy? How do you know that this is not salpingitis? Well, it could be salpingitis, but ectopic pregnancies end when your diverticulosis starts, which is over 50, under 50, under 50, over 50. So diverticulosis is so common a feature of human condition on a meat, fat-filled, disgusting Western diet that almost everybody, by the time they're 60, 70, 80, is gonna have these outpocketings of their colon. It is an expected finding because a low, uh, fiber, low vegetable, high meat diet creates higher colonic pressure that causes these outpoppings. Vegetarians just don't get diverticulosis. So if you don't get diverticulosis, you can't get diverticulitis. Most people who have diverticulosis are asymptomatic. Now you have to distinguish between the pain of diverticulosis, which is left lower quadrant pain, sometimes a little tenderness, from diverticulitis, which is an infectious disease. Diverticulosis can have left lower quadrant pain and constipation, occasionally some bleeding. Well, it's actually the most common, this and AVM, of the bleedings, but how do we put it this way? When you're bleeding, lower GI bleeding, diverticulosis and angiodysplasia are the two most common causes. When you have diverticulosis, however, only a small number ever bleed. When you bleed from the lower GI tract, it's often diverticulosis. When you have diverticulosis, only a small percentage bleed. How do you know it's infected? Fever and a white count. Very straightforward. Now the most accurate test for diverticulosis, different than diverticulitis. For instance, in diverticulosis, there is no danger of doing colonoscopy. It's not like you're gonna poke that thing into the diverticulum and instantly perforate it. See, colonoscopy is a little bit dangerous when you do diverticulitis. We talk about barium enema, but barium enema is disgusting. Go stay on a cold table and retain this thing and see where it goes. So first of all, it's not quite as accurate, it's hard to do, but barium is an anti Answer if it said that you're looking for colonic pathology and you think there's a false negative lower endoscopy. So how would you detect it if there was a false negative? That's the only answer for the 5% false negatives with lower endoscopy and colonoscopy. So we'd like to say that bran and psyllium and methyl cellulose and all bran and putting uh, uh, carrots in your booty will delay the progression. We're not really sure that they do. What we do know is this, that the concept of saying that seeds and nuts get stuck in your diverticuli is just wrong. That doesn't really, it's not like you're gonna use something that's actually gonna get stuck and clog it up. So it is also that by the time you develop diverticuli, there's nothing to reverse them. Bran and psyllium husks, methyl cellulose, various forms of fiber, metamucil, we think will delay the progression, but you can't get rid of them. Diverticulitis is an older patient with the diverticulosis, same left lower quadrant pain, but the difference is more tenderness, more fever, and the other difference is you can use colonoscopy to make the diagnosis of diverticulosis, but colonoscopy and barium, we get concerned, have a higher risk of perforation of diverticulitis because diverticulitis causes some weakening of the bowel wall. You like that, how I act that out? Some weakening of the bowel wall, and then we pop! So most of these things are too nonspecific to make the diagnosis. Left lower quadrant pain and tender, no fever, osis. With fever and white count, itis. Best initial test, since we're not gonna do a scope, is CT scan, not sonogram, what will x-ray show in diverticulitis? X-ray, nothing. X-rays of the abdomen have only one use. Abdominal x-rays are only good for small bowel obstruction, for ileus, not for any diverticular disease. For diverticulitis, these tests are relatively contraindicated because they, ha they have a higher risk of perforation X-ray and sonogram are useless. That's why the answer is scanning it, scanning the diverticulum, and the treatment is antibiotics. So since you're covering E. coli and the anaerobes that are in bowel, well, what covers the bowel flora? You have to cover gram negatives and you have to cover anaerobes. 
So covering gram negatives and anaerobes, there's no one single thing. There's multiple things you could use. The most common answer is ciprofloxacin and metronidazole, not in the same way that we use it for perianal disease and Crohn's. In perianal disease and Crohn's, we're doing it because there's, an, as we said, an anti-inflammatory component that seals up fistulas, but because quinolones, any quinolone, doesn't have to be ciprofloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, gemifloxacin, ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, gemifloxacin, cover E. coli in most common gram negatives, and metronidazole for, for anaerobes. Now, levofloxacin will cover anaerobes by itself. So you can use levofloxacin as a single agent or the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase combinations. The beta-lactam, beta-lactamase combinations have as least as good a coverage for anaerobes as metronidazole. So that's why you can use them for abscesses with anaerobes, you can use them into sinuses, and you can use them for lung abscesses. Beta-lactam, beta-lactamase combinations, amoxicillin clavulanic, you'd know it by the trade name Augmentin, the intravenous version of it, which is ampicillin combined with Solbactam, Ticarcillin with clavulonic acid, Piperacillin with Tazobactam, and from the point of view of diverticulitis, they're all about the same. See, I'm rubbing my diverticulum there, see? So, beta-lactam, beta-lactamase combinations will all cover anaerobes and all cover E. coli because you're not having to cover Pseudomonas. So you see, if this was neutropenic fever, you'd have to use an anti-pseudomonal drug. But inside the bowel, they're all okay. Which of these goes into the biliary system the most? Oh, I want to treat uh, uh, ascending cholangitis. I want to treat divert. I want to treat. Excuse me, cholecystitis. The one that goes into the biliary system is piperacillin. Piperacillin is secreted into the bile because it's hepatically excreted, which is unusual for most antibiotics. Now, there's a whole other class that's good for anaerobes in the bowel. Yeah, 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 we said metronidazole. Clindamycin is for respiratory anaerobes. Clindamycin is for anaerobic strep, peptococcus, peptostreptococcus. The other class that covers anaerobes is carbapenems. Any one of them, imipenem, miropenem, erdipenem, doripenem, imipenem, miropenem, erdipenem, doripenem, imipenem, miropenem, erdipenem, doripenem, imipenem, miropenem, erdipenem, doripenem, all of them cover anaerobes, particularly in your bowel. So then you say, I know, or I know what you're thinking. Wait a second, I know what you're thinking. Dr. Fisher, what if they put all of these in the choices and they asked me to choose between them? Well, that type of thinking is magical evil thinking, where you think that they're going to ask you to choose between things that are either equivalent or interchangeable. So I'm going to tell you though, what if you do get to a question and they put, I just said you could use this, the beta-lactam, beta-lactamase combinations or the carbapenems. And they put them all there. In terms of efficacy, they're equal. So if you see several drugs that have the same efficacy, if they're really the same efficacy, and they're all in the choices, how can you be asked to choose? The answer is, it means that you're missing a contraindication. If you are shown several things as choices that have the same efficacy, benefit, two tests that have the same accuracy, and they're both in the choices, you're missing a contraindication. You're missing the penicillin allergy. You're missing the anaphylaxis with penicillin, and you don't want to use carbapenems. So if these were all in the same choices, you're missing a contraindication. Now, surgery is the answer for diverticulitis. Uh, one, when there's no response to medical therapy. Two, when you keep getting recurrent episodes. And it keeps coming back because we said that there's nothing that reverses diverticulosis and diverticulosis can become infected. So are you more likely to recommend surgery for a younger patient or an older patient? Well, certainly if you have perforation, you have to do surgery to close up the perforation. But what if there's those things, you're just having frequent recurrences? You have a 45-year-old person that has three recurrences in a year. You have a 75-year-old person with three recurrences in the year. Who needs the surgery more? 
Well, the younger person, why? Well, if you're gonna throw out your car next year, would you pay to have the engine fixed or have a new engine? Well, if you're planning to have a classic car or you live in Gubameng, you've got to keep it in repair. So a younger person who's 45, 50 is gonna be driving that colon for the next 30 years. Whereas an older person, 75 and 80, well, why undergo the morbidity of surgery if your life expectancy is not as long. And now you're like, what am I, is this ageism? No, 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 the answer is, what would you do if I said to you that the recovery from bowel surgery is two to four weeks, would you waste your time with that? You shouldn't. So the younger person is more likely to need the surgery because they're gonna be using that colon forever because nothing reverses the diverticuli and they don't wanna keep getting three episodes a year. Colon cancer screening, is one of the four cancer screening methods. Pap smear lowers mortality, mammography lowers mortality, colon cancer screening lowers mortality, and lung cancer and long-term smokers. The standard of care for colon cancer is that you do it for people who are at the age of 50 every 10 years with colonoscopy. And every time that they try and say to you, what about the other tests? Sigmoidoscopy misses 40% that are proximal. If the, there's blood in the stool, you have to scope them anyway. Barium enema is only if you have a potential false negative colonoscopy because it's a disgusting test and not generally speaking as uh, any doesn't have any better efficacy than colonoscopy. Virtual colonoscopy is a very nice idea. Put them through a CT scan. The problem is it misses small lesions and capsules are not cancer screening. It's a bleeding screening test, a bleeding test in the small bowel. So there's nothing as effective as colonoscopy every 10 years. Now, the frequency of the screening is that in the standard patient, you do every 10 years, but if you have one family, family member, one, even if the family member had colon cancer when they're 90, you start screening at the age of 40. 10 years earlier than the family member or age 40, whichever is younger, which means if grandma had colon cancer at 70, you start at 40. If grandpa had colon cancer at 60, you start at 40. So 10 years earlier or which age 40, whichever is younger and you repeat the scope depending on the family member. In other words, if the family member had their colon cancer young, you should go more frequently. Now, colon cancer screening guidelines can get down very, 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 very bite-sized. The American Gastro Association has it broken up into 20 separate categories. That's not your thing. Your thing is not to screw this one up. The most common wrong answer is they say the person's 55 the family member is 55, and they say when to scope, and you go, oh, 45, because it's 10 years earlier. Nope, 40, because it's 10 years earlier, or 40, whichever is earlier, and more frequent if the family member was young. Now, here we go, ready? Colon cancer syndromes. Three family members, two generations, one premature. Oh my God, it's like a, it's like a, Telenovela, Univision, la historia de su culo, tres miembros de su familia, dos generaciones, uno temprano. So this is sometimes known as, what's the other name for hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer? Is the Lynch syndromes. And the Lynch syndromes is crescendo genetics, and you start at 25 and go every one or two years. So three family members, two generations, one premature Lynch syndrome starting early. Now I've got some good and easy news for you on the other cancer, screen, cancer syndromes. The other ones are, whether it's Poots Jaegers, Gardner syndrome, FAP, and juvenile polyposis, the answer is start early screening in all of them at age 12 for most and eight for Poots Jaegers. And now it's easy because they've all been put into the same group because they're all crescendo genetics. We used to be like, ah, juvenile polyposis, who cares? Well, now we care. FAP is also the answer to the question, which cancer syndrome has the highest rate of penetrance of any hereditary cancer syndrome? Because 100% of people with FAP, 100% get colon cancer by the age of 50. And you can start having polyps as early as the age of 12. 
Now, why can you get away with just sigmoidoscopy when I badmouthed sigmoidoscopy just a minute ago? Because unlike sigmoidoscopy for the general population, which misses 40% of cancers that are proximal, in FAP and Gardner syndrome and juvenile polyposis, when the polyps occur, they occur throughout the whole colon, so you only have to go as far as the sigmoid colon. FAP starts screening every year at the age of 12. Now, if you've had a previous polyp, you should get rescoped in three to five years if you're at risk of polyp because you're at higher risk if you've had a previous polyp. And if you had previous colon cancer, you should get screened a year later and then a couple years later. So, but FAP, age 12, thousands of polyps. Everybody has polyps by the age 25 and everybody's got colon cancer by the age of 50. Here, three or five years after the original polyp. Pooch Eggers, how interesting, what stands out in your mind? Melanotic spots in your lips. Melanotic spots in your lips and hamartomas. Now, hamartomas are something that if you look at previous editions of things, it will say no extra screening. So if you're uh, dumb enough to be using uh, two editions ago of various books, it will say no extra screening in the past but that's incorrect, it's a change. Hamartomas have less malignant potential than dysplastic polyps, but they still have malignant potential. Blah, 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 start screening at the age of eight. The other thing about put shakers is that you have gotta go looking for all the other solid organ tumors around the body. Gardner syndrome, and Gardner syndrome, in the past, no extra screening. Now, age 12. The other thing about Gardner's syndrome is that you've got to look for cancers elsewhere because it's a genetic disease and it has an APC, an adenomatous polyposis coli gene, gives you extra teeth, desmoid tumors, osteomas, teratomas, but Gardner's syndrome is screening with sigmoidoscopy at the age of 12, the same as FAP. Turcot syndrome is simply the association of colon cancer with CNS lesions. There's no extra change about that. There's nothing else to do about that. Juvenile polyposis, again, like Putz-Jagers, they're hamartomas. It's a change in that you have to start screening at the age of 12. So APC, or adenomatous polyposis coli, thousands of polyps now, and they're adenomas. Juvenile polyposis, a much smaller number, but here's the other thing, is that you have to do upper endoscopy too because this genetic syndrome gives you 5, 10, 15, 20% chance of having uh, uh, gastric tumors. So you can have a lifetime risk of a gastric tumor in juvenile polyposis at 20-30%. 30%. So that's why you have to do upper endoscopy too. Puchager's hamartomas, juvenile hamartomas. So, what are the ones that are pretty much all the same? Screening at the age of 12, juvenile polyposis, Gardner's, FAP, all screening at 12 with Puchager's with melanotic spits, uh, spots starting at the age of 8. You don't know what to do? Say age 12, right? Anticoagulation with colonoscopy. Uh, you're on a pixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban, and you need to get scoped. The scope doesn't change the risk of bleeding. It's what if you have to have a polyp cut. So the reason that you're stopping your apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban is not for the colonoscopy. It's for the possibility of a polypectomy. But these drugs go away in a day or two. So you only need to stop them for one to two days. And they're not going to be cutesy and say, should you stop for one day or for two days? Because with the exception of metal valves, missing a day or two days for AFib doesn't matter, and no arcs are not what you use for metal valves anyway. We use warfarin for metal valves. But you only have to skip a day. The same way that they become effective on the same day you use them, they go away. Now, warfarin has to be stopped for several days because it has a much longer half-life and also has a much longer effect on your vitamin K-dependent clotting factors. 
and metal valves are the only thing, metal valves and mitral stenosis are the only thing that should be getting warfarin. The other thing shouldn't get warfarin. See, warfarin management's a pain, isn't it? It's difficult. Is it three days, four days, five days? The answer, if it's a metal valve, it's three days. If it's AFib, it's five days. Why stop the anticoagulants? Not for the scope, but for the possibility of polypectomy. Start screening with colon cancer at the age of 50. Start 10 years earlier if you have one family member. If your family member is at the age of 60, go every five years. If you had a polyp before, rescope it three to five years. If you had colon cancer resected, go at one year, then three years, then five years. Now, put Jaegers, FAP, Gardner's syndrome, juvenile polyposis, all get early screening. And they're all at the age of 12 at sigmoidoscopy, except for put Jaegers at age eight. I think you'll be good to go if you just say, put them all, lump them in with extra screening much younger, and you should be just fine.